Great. Thank you very much, Sahel, for inviting me along this evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be back talking uh, on this program. I'm going to be talking today about the book, um, some of the ideas from Nervous States that Sahel mentioned, which, um, yeah. which uh, Sahel's already flagged up. Um, it's a book that came out last month, and at the, um, this has various, uh, relates to some of the themes that Sir Hale's already mentioned in a number of ways. Um, maybe I can get onto that question of how victimhood has become a new type of political weaponry. Um, there are, running through the, set, through the book, there is a concern with a couple of what you might see as classically modern um, philosophical distinctions. These are ideas that emerge in the um, two classically modern distinctions emerging in the mid-17th century, um, one between war and peace. This is something that is commonly associated with the ideas of the English political theorist Thomas Hobbes, for whom the central purpose of the modern state was to bring an end to war within national boundaries, so as to that war becomes something that one state does to another state when it traverses its boundary. The formation of the sovereign nation state in the mid-17th century, what's sometimes called the Westphalian state, which is really how we can still understand nation states today, gave war a particularly uh, a simple uh, uh, categorization as something that happens when one state strays into the territory of another state. The second distinction, which is often associated with the ideas of René Descartes is a distinction between the mind and the body. Uh, what Descartes, oh, thanks very much, sir. But what Descartes refers to as um, res cogitans, thinking uh, uh, substances, and res um, extensa, the extended physical form of the human body. And although this is rather a kind of grand thesis, uh, one of the questions that I pose at the beginning of the book is to what extent do these distinctions still hold credibility? Now, I'm not suggesting they've suddenly fallen apart. In fact, you could say that the rise of psychological sciences, of psychiatry, of psychoanalysis in the late 19th century, that the rise of aerial warfare in the, late, in the early 20th century test these particular tropes of 17th century modernity in very important ways. So these distinctions have been falling apart uh, for uh, over 100 years, well over 100 years. In fact, if you want to talk about where the feelings really start to become a concern of politicians, the rise of aerial warfare is one of the most important drivers of the political interest in public affect and emotion. The first attempt to try and understand and to measure public emotion in, in uh, countries such as Britain arose during the Blitz, because in as much as aerial warfare is an attempt to try and demoralize a civilian population, and not simply to try and destroy infrastructure, although it's that as well, it is never necessarily an attempt to try and bring one nation's um, uh, technologies and, war, uh, and, and weaponry uh, to bear on the feelings and minds of another civilian population. So the rise of aerial warfare is one of the first ways in which feelings starts to enter politics in a major way. But what I want to suggest is that what we're witnessing with our politics in the early 21st century is that these distinctions on which modern state and modern society were founded have not just lost credibility in a kind of empirical historical sense, they are no longer treated as politically uh, meaningful in various ways. And this is uh, something that we see uh, around us in our politics. And one another way of putting this is that the, what, what it means for an act to be violent, the meaning of violence, the definition of violence has become harder and harder to uh, specify, to clarify. So we see, I think, anyone who reads the papers will probably notice from time to time that every now and then the metaphors of war are spreading into civil society. The idea of a culture war is something that has been around for some time. It's often in America seen as something that emerges from the upheavals of the 1960s, from 1968 in particular, but that liberals and conservatives are in some kind of culture war. This suggests they've lost any common frame of reference altogether and now uh, they are simply in some state of combat with each other. Equally, uh, warring political factions. The, uh, one of the uh, first books about Brexit, which was by the uh, journalist Tim Shipman, was called All Out War. It was looking at the way in which the Brexit referendum was fought as if it was uh, a type of uh, war, uh, of one side against another. 
There is uh, anyone who uses Twitter will be familiar with some of the slang of, oh, this person just got murdered on Twitter, uh, there's been a pile on, someone's been bodied. These kind of metaphors have become a kind of normal part of civil discourse in various ways. At the same time, what we actually mean by war and what we actually mean by violence has become harder to specify in various ways. So information war and cyber war, we're led to believe that Russia is engaging in various forms of information war and cyber war in relation to things like free speech. It's become harder to specify exactly what counts as legitimate use of free speech and what is a form of emotional harm uh, or what is simply a uh, kind of metaphor. And the whole notion of hate speech and trolling has become, has made the very notion of the public sphere harder and harder to uh, sustain. Um, we have um, <coughs> these examples of famous troll-like behaviour. Um, Milo Yiannopoulos, the famous troll, formerly of Breitbart, no longer quite as famous as he was after he lost his book deal and various things, but he was famous for saying, this was one of his kind of catchphrases, I don't care about your feelings. Now, the interesting thing about this claim is that it's clearly not true. The whole point of a figure like Milo is that feelings do matter. If feelings didn't matter to one of these trolls, they wouldn't have any kind of raison d'etre. This is slightly going back to what Suhail was saying earlier, um, is that um, in order for someone to uh, develop their kind of personal brand, via acts of hostility, it's very important that people are able and willing or available to take offence to them. There's that famous um, phrase of George Orwell's that various free speech campaigners like to use, which is, if freedom means anything at all, it means the freedom to tell people things they don't want to hear. This is something that people like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, various free speech uh, warriors and advocates have used over the years. And um, it's become a kind of totem for various people, uh, particularly around the outright, and some of what are called the inter um, intellectual dark web of people like Steven Pinker, Jordan Peterson, these kind of figures. But obviously, one of the things that that claim suggests, if you say that freedom, if it's to mean anything at all, is to tell people stuff they don't want to hear, that means that the speaker has got to have an audience who is going to stay there and listen to them and listen to the things that they don't want to hear, otherwise that first person is not going to be free. Someone like Milo needs people who are going to listen to him and take offence to him, otherwise his entire raison d'etre doesn't really work. So this is a kind of, you could say, a kind of performative contradiction, this quote about, I don't care about your feelings. And then you have the famous Steve Bannon. Uh, this is an email that was leaked to Breitbart in October 2017. He says, dude, we are in a global existential war where our enemy exists in social media and you are jerking yourself off with marginalia. You should be owning this conversation because you are everything they hate. Drop your toys pick up your tools and go help save Western civilization. Now, obviously this is kind of, you know, a rather sort of grandstanding uh, email. Um, lots of people have suggested that we shouldn't pay so much attention to Steve Bannon in the first place because that's the only thing that he really kind of depends on is getting attention from the media. But nevertheless, what I think these kinds of comments and statements reveal is that at least the metaphors of war and of combat have become central to the type of um, uh, political... Uh, activities that these people are engaged in. Now, there is this term that many of you will have seen seems to have risen heavily over recent years, which is weaponization. And this is if you put weaponization into Google, of trade, of space, of information, of social media, of the dollar, synonyms of WhatsApp, of outer space, of AI. So weaponization, I think, is another important term that is worth interrogating here as we think about the blurring of violence and the inability to be able to tell exactly what counts as war and what counts as an attack. One of the things, as I was writing my book, because one of the starting points of the book is to try and understand why has, um, where has this term weaponization come from? Um, and in a sense, if you want to think about perhaps one of the most iconic instances of weaponization of recent years, the ability to turn a civilian airliner into a missile it tells us something about the way in which civilian life can be seen as something that can be viewed from a different aspect and applied in a completely different context for a completely different purpose and a very, very malevolent and murderous purpose in this instance. But that key instance, that key issue, and this comes back a little bit to the question of contextualization of language and decontextualization of language, is that the key moment in weaponization 
is to look at something that is designed not as a weapon or used not as a weapon and to view it from a different aspect and to suddenly see it in a different way. Now, anyone who's uh, here is familiar with anything of uh, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein um, will recognise, and even if you're not familiar with Wittgenstein, you you'll, might know this famous, um, whatever you call one of these things, um, optical illusions or not quite an optical illusion, one of these, uh, it's a fundamentally ambivalent image because it's both a duck and a rabbit. And uh, the reason Wittgenstein was very interested in this image, and he has this in his book Philosophical Investigations, is that what Wittgenstein is interested in about this is the fact that in order to see it as a duck, you can't then at the same time see it as a rabbit, but as soon as you start seeing it as a rabbit, you can't then see it as a duck. And this is what Wittgenstein described as an aspect change, that the same object, could, which didn't change its form, but could suddenly be seen in a different way, suddenly switches in what it means, in its purpose, in its context, in its surrounding uh, uh, implications and meaning. And in a sense, I suppose, to go back to the comment that Suhail was ending with about making these very kind of innocent-seeming <coughs> comments, is that there is a kind of duck-rabbit thing going on there as well, which is that if someone makes, if Jordan Peterson makes a very innocent comment about, you know, the future of Western civilization, viewed in one way it's completely innocent, viewed in another way it's completely malevolent and uh, uh, quasi-incendiary, but it's always possible to flip back from one to the other. So this thing of weaponization, I think we need to see that partly uh, in terms of uh, aspect changes. Now, the kind of aspect change that is at work in weaponization would be more like something, you know, if you were to have a beer glass, which you were drinking out of, but then suddenly you realize that you can throw it across a pub or you can um, uh, throw it in someone's face, you have seen something at one minute as something for as a receptacle for beer in the space of civil society and sitting in the pub. The next minute, you suddenly see it in a different way and it can change uh, the entire surrounding frame of meaning. Um, and I think that one of the ways in which, I'm going to come on to this in a second, but one of the ways in which I think troll culture works most effectively online is not just in terms of the examples that Sahail was using of people making comments that seem innocent but then can, can see, seem malevolent in a different kind of context, but also the ability to take someone's words out of their intended frame of meaning and to throw them back out in another frame of meaning. This is something that all journalists suffer from the entire time on Twitter uh, or all politicians is that you give a long speech, you write an article of uh, a thousand words, and suddenly someone manages to pull out one particular line and to throw it around Twitter in a particular, as if it, you, know, you can cut out the rest of what's around it, and you've effectively kind of, maybe not weaponized their words, but you have weaponized something in the sense that you have uh, deliberately uh, abstracted something from its intended frame of meaning, put it into a different frame of meaning, uh, and created the basis for conflict. Now, I'm going to try and just talk, talk, talk about a couple of um, themes here, both of which come up in my book, um, which I think can speak to the question uh, that this uh, talk series is, uh, is, is concerned with. Um, and I think the, the thing that I think is most perplexing is why is it that so much online discourse seems to have many of the qualities of violence much of the time? Um, now, the first question... How do we think about the meaning of violence? And one of the most important books, I think, for making sense of this is Hannah Arendt's book On Violence, which was uh, written in 1970. And Hannah Arendt, in the book, she makes a very important distinction between power and violence. And I think this it will do a lot of work for us in unlocking some of the kind of ambiguities and some of the problems associated with online, um, online speech and online discourse. Now, for Arendt, power can be used in various ways. It can be put to very bad uses. It can be put to very good uses. But power has a constructive quality. Power is the ability to coordinate people. It involves things like bureaucracies, parliaments, legislation, organizations. It's the ability to mobilize lots of people in a single direction. It has what it gives birth to something. Arendt was very interested in what she called the natality of politics. That's the ability of new things to be brought into being and the ability to create new th policies, new forms of law, new organizations, that politics, because it, had, because it was the use of power, had the ability to create a world. Now, it can create a bad world, or it can create a good world, or it can use power for bad ends or for good ends. But nevertheless, there is something constructive about it. It creates more than, it, it, it leaves the world in a more elaborate uh, and intricate way than it found it. And violence is what she called a pure instrument. Violence is something 
that involved no acts of uh, uh, organization or deliberation. It involves no ability to actually, it doesn't necessarily involve coordinating people very much. Violence, to distinguish violence from power, one has to focus on the purely instrumental nature of the moment of violence. So an example of something like violence would be something like um, aerial bombing. Aerial bombing doesn't construct anything. It doesn't try to govern the world that it is bombing. It doesn't, it's not even necessarily a form of empire. It is something that purely through the ability to drop a bomb from a great height has this ability to wreak devastation on the ground below, and to wreak fear and to wreak panic and so on. Equally, uh, the purpose of terrorism is simply to make full use of the instruments at their dis at, at disposal, whether that be an aeroplane or a bomb or whatever it might be. But it has a purely instrumental nature. It doesn't rely, fundamentally, violence on the ability to coordinate people in time and space or to create anything uh, new. Um, so violence is fundamentally about weaponry. This notion of weaponization, just to kind of start to map some of this out, the idea that weaponization is becoming a problem in uh, civil society is to suggest that violence is becoming more available in various different and newer ways, perhaps because of some kind of duck-rabbit aspect change where more technologies, more objects, more tools are becoming seen in their capacity for violence rather than their capacity for, um, uh, for power. Um, and although most of the time, Arendt is very clear that most of the time power and violence work uh, together. So in order for there to be a modern state, you have governments, you have bureaucracies, you have parliaments, you have laws, you have courts, you have all these sorts of things that make up the uh, organisation of power, but at the same time you need to have at your disposal things like, well you don't need to, but you tend to, have things like uh, prisons, uh, riot vans, guns, uh, tools and weapons and technologies that allow for that purely instrumental notion where there is no aspiration to coordinate, no aspiration to achieve consensus or any type of deliberation, but there is a pure moment of uh, the use of weaponry. Um, and this is a very important quote, I think, for thinking a bit about um, how this begins to play out in relation to something like troll, troll culture. She says the extreme form of power is all against one. So you had a whole society which was all ganged up on one person and everybody in that society all believed the same thing, all wanted the same thing, and they decided that this one person was, uh, uh, the, was the problem, um, that would be an extreme form of power. So just to stress, she's not, just because power has a constructive quality, she's not suggesting that power is in and of itself good. But the extreme form of violence is one against all. And that, I think, starts to bring us towards some of the kind of curiosities of something like troll culture, but equally certain forms of terrorism, that uh, it is... Um, uh, uh, that what violence offers is a type of action that is available to the person who doesn't have any power. So to act in the most purely violent fashion, and I think Arendt is ambiguous as to whether a kind of form of pure violence is ever really possible, because even after all, um, even terrorists have funding networks, they have forms of organisation, they have forms of coordination, but when we think about some of the most shocking forms of violence in our society today, certainly some of the scariest forms of violence in our society today, they are the ones that seem to erupt out of nowhere with very little organisation. And I think that's how this goes together with the whole notion of, of, of weaponisation as well, because the, this notion of weaponisation suggests that the tools and the objects that we think of as serving civil society and consensus and forms of collective power actually can be turned against us in certain ways. And that's what, uh, how the mentality of troll <coughs> culture tends to work. And she says that the practice of violence, like all action, changes the world, but the most probable change is more violent world. And this is the problem that I suppose so much of American foreign policy faces, which is that American foreign policy, as it's founded less and less on power and more and more on violence, as it has less and less aspiration to actually govern foreign territories or to famously put boots on the ground and all that sort of thing, and more and more aspiration simply to uh, uh, use things like drone technology and that sort of thing, the ability to actually, uh, it certainly has an impact on the world, but it doesn't actually construct a new world or create anything. It doesn't generate any new power. All it does is to uh, render a world that has a greater tendency towards violence. There is also, I think, an important issue that we need to grapple with in thinking about online discourse, and this is a kind of key theme in my book as well, is that speed and violence have some kind of interesting association. Um, as anyone who knows anything from the work of Paul Virilio will be familiar, a lot of Virilio's work is about the role of war in facilitating technological acceleration um, and um, creating 
uh, putting to work technologies in the service of a faster society. But I think it's also worth thinking a bit about the nature of conflict in, for instance, to go back again to the ideas of Thomas Hobbes, who I mentioned earlier. Thomas Hobbes was a political theorist who believed that the alternative to a civil society based around peace and rule of law and so on was what he called a state of nature. And in a state of nature, he believed that human beings would end up in what he called famously a war of all against all. It's one of the most famous lines of Thomas Hobbes, 1651 in, in Leviathan, a war of all against all. And the reason Hobbes believed that human beings would end up in this condition wasn't because he thought people were bad, it wasn't because he thought that people uh, were naturally violent or that they are naturally particularly rivalrous or they have big egos or they hate each other, any of that sort of stuff. The problem is the problem of preemption. This is the fundamental psychological problem that Hobbes sees in the state of nature, is that if two strangers encounter each other in a society that lacks rule of law or civil, uh, civil institutions, the problem is that I don't know what your intentions are, you don't know what my intentions are, and I'm not going to wait to find out. I don't have time, and I don't have any kind of trusted intermediary institution to wait and see whether or not you are a peaceful or a violent person, so it makes sense for me to take actions into my own mass into my own hands and preempt what you're going to do. So violence becomes a rational thing to do, a rational course of action, because it is um, uh, uh, because of the, the the problem of time fundamentally. I'm going to come on to this again in a second, but the digital computer, which is at the heart of so much of what we're talking about right now, and which structures so much of our um, uh, of our social and economic and political lives. But it's worth remembering, and I'm going to come back to this, that the computer was originally invented, again in the context of uh, aerial bombardment, aerial warfare. It was invented during World War II, but specifically to try and accelerate forms of cognition beyond the limits of the human. That the human mind was not capable of tracking, predicting, and uh, preempting the movements of incoming aerial threats the computer became a necessary tool of war because war had speeded up to the point where the human mind was no longer capable of being able to predict and spot incoming threats. So it is the speed of war that leads to the uh, augmentation of rationality and cognition leading to the computer. Um, finally, uh, I think it's kind of... I was looking back at um, another example of the relationship between war and speed, violence and speed, if you look back at the justifications that the Bush administration gave for torture, there was a particular famous uh, memo that was issued during the so-called War on Terror that articulated why torture might be necessary uh, and might fit within, uh, uh, might be legal. And it was that the nature of the threats that America faced meant that extracting information quickly had become uh, necessary in a way that had never been seen before. That this was what made the war on terror unprecedented was that there wasn't the time to uh, extract information from people or to detect information or to find information by other means and that torture became a way of accelerating uh, the drift towards or the, the need to try and extract information from people. So I want to just kind of augment some of what Arendt was saying as well with a kind of hypothesis I suppose which is that perhaps power and although I think it's worth stressing that power doesn't necessarily me mean good uh, forms of politics, but nevertheless, politics of some kind of constructive, consensual, democratic form requires forms of power. This is what Arendt is trying to remind us. But that perhaps power requires and facilitates the interruption of temporal flow in some way. Maybe in order for there to be power in society, in order for there to be political institutions, such as democratic institutions, uh, legal mechanisms, uh, other forms of civic association and organisation, there has to be the ability to lay down things like rules, uh, forms of uh, norms, uh, uh, documents and so on, which endure, which stand outside of the constant flow of time, which are impervious to efforts to try and speed them up at the whole time, that, that can set their own pace, just regardless of what pace politics starts to be played out at. Um, meanwhile, violence exists in real time. I think whether one is hit fast or slow matters very much to the nature of the impact that, is, that happens. If someone punches you very slowly in the face, they haven't really punched you. Violence is something that necessarily happens in real time. It's something that has a kind of performative or executive dimension to it. The, the way in which our violence is played out is fundamental to what violence is. 
Now, one of the um, figures who's very interesting to me in my book, or when I was researching the book, is Karl von Clausewitz, who was, the, um, he was a German, a Prussian general who was obsessed with uh, Napoleon and wrote a very famous book called On War, which was published after his death in 1831. And von Clausewitz was fascinated as to why Napoleon had, was such a genius uh, a, a military strategy. But one of the interesting things to me, going back to some of these kinds of books, because one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to try and trace some of the underpinnings of the problems that we currently face in our public discourse and public life. One of the things that I think is very interesting in Clausewitz's writings about Napoleon and on war, and this is all, as I say, in the early 19th century, um, just after the late end of the 18th, early 19th century he was looking at, is that what you can see in some of Clausewitz's writings about war and about the genius of Napoleon uh, is a different approach to the problem of truth. And I think also what lies within some of those writings is a glimmer of what we now call post-truth. There has been this uh, whole interest in post-truth uh, that has... Um, uh, taken off over the last two or three years. It was the Oxford English Dictionary Word of the Year, 2016, and so on. Um, but one of the things that I would argue is that what post-truth really refers to is an attitude to truth that is taken during times of war. So that it is not uncommon for people to take an approach to truth that we currently see in relation to things like the Trump White House and so on. But normally it is something that is taken during times of war. Meanwhile, populists and authoritarians such as Trump take the same approach to truth, but they apply it in times of peace. And here are just some of the characteristics of the way in which someone like Clausewitz understood the status of truth and knowledge in times of war. The first thing which makes truth and knowledge in war different from its status during peacetime or civil society is that it becomes crucial that you know things first before other people. Like, it's no good just being accurate or credible or achieving agreement with other people about what's going on. You need to know quickly. The question of time and speed and, uh, 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 and, and sensitivity to change becomes all important during times of war in a way that is not true during times of peace. Now, interestingly, and this is one of the things I try and kind of play out within the book, is that it also becomes true increasingly in things like financial markets as well, is that being a, the first person to detect a price movement becomes all important, and it becomes uh, 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 more important than a, a consensual uh, view of truth. Encryption and secrecy of intelligence becomes absolutely crucial. This was something that Clausewitz noticed that Napoleon did brilliantly, was the ability to move knowledge to where it's most needed in secrecy at the time when it's most needed. Uh, so knowledge becomes, rather than something that is used to kind of represent the world as a kind of picture of the world, as it had been for people like Descartes in the mid-17th century, it becomes a tool that needs to be transported to the place where it is needed now. And it needs to be done so in a spirit of secrecy using forms of encryption. There is a crucial emphasis in war, Clausewitz argued, on sensory awareness. This isn't really cognition or understanding. This is the ability to sense things, the ability to detect things, the ability to be able to feel one's way through a situation. There's that famous phrase, the fog of war. Nobody really quite knows what's going on during times of war. Therefore, the most crucial human attribute is the ability to feel one's way through it. Um, now, it's interesting. One of the things that Clausewitz wrote in this book was that for a great general, he thought a great general had what he called a skilled ability to scent out the truth. So he turned to the uh, metaphor of the nose. A lot of the early scientific pioneers and people like René Descartes were very interested in how, we see, how the world looks to us. The eye was the most important organ for uh, the most important means of sensation for encountering the world in an objective scientific fashion. It was the, how we get the ability to attain some kind of objective knowledge. It's through our eyes for someone like René Descartes. But for Clausewitz, the nose starts to become a more important sensory device, the ability to kind of sniff where one is, to be able to, to sort of trust one's senses. And that ability to kind of feel, sense, and detect where one is and where one is going becomes increasingly augmented during times of war by various technologies of things like uh, various um, uh, often called sniffing devices. The, um, during Vietnam, the US military developed various technologies for what they called uh, sniffing um, uh, uh, various sniffing out the enemy in jungles and that sort of thing. This idea that it's, when you're not able to see what's in front of you because you're in this fog of war, you need a different type of approach to knowledge, which is the ability to kind of sense things in some uh, non-visual way. Um, fundamentally, the key problem for Clausewitz about war is that there is too much information. 
there is a sensory overload. There is everything is happening at once. You're in a, you're in a move. Everything is happening fast. Everything is complex. There is very little credible, certain information. And the most important attribute of a leader or a general in that situation is the ability to retain what he called resolution, the ability to retain some kind of strength of mind, uh, or what sometimes called keeping one's head. It's the ability to keep on going with where you think you are going, regardless of all of this uh, overload of information that is coming in. And this would become known during World War II as dis distinguishing the signal from the noise. So there's just constant kind of sensory overload going on, too much noise, too many uh, loud sounds, and uh, too much misinformation and, uh, and, and rumor and so on. And the key thing in a situation like this is the ability to keep on going regardless. And then finally, and I think this is what relates in some kind of interesting ways back to the question of uh, the feelings of victimhood. Clausewitz was very, uh, 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 he was very certain that it was far more important that any public statement that was made was one that was attuned to its emotional uh, impact on its audience. So that every time a general speaks publicly, if they are in a situation of war and equally in um, perhaps a, you know, a sort of, uh, some sort of military leader in a political situation, what they've got to be thinking about is what is going to be the emotional impact of my words. And every single statement has to be geared towards thinking about how is this going to affect the audience. Now, one of the most, I think, interesting things that is there in Klaus Witz's writing, which really relates straight back to that question about Trump and those comments that Trevor Noah was making in that video earlier, is that Klaus Witz was clear that actually, if you really want to mobilize people, actually telling them, reminding them of their past defeats is a far greater way of mobilizing people than, than telling them how great they are, telling them that they've been humiliated, telling them that they've been trodden on. He, one of his key concerns back in the early 19th century was the fact that the Prussians had repeatedly lost to the Napoleonic armies, and he didn't know how he could rouse some kind of national pride uh, amongst his fellow countrymen. But one of the things that he thought might work best was to keep reminding them of these defeats, keep telling people that they've been defeated, that the best way to start to rouse people in people a desire for violence and a desire for combat is to tell them that they've lost in the past. And in a way, this is, I suppose, another word for this emotion in particular is resentment. It's the resentment that one has not been respected, that one has not been, uh, uh, that, 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 that one has been belittled in some way. Um, and what Clausewitz was really noticing was that this trick, if you like, could be used for all sorts of audiences. You don't need to have an audience that has necessarily been belittled uh, or disrespected or trodden on, but it is uh, every single type of public statement could be geared towards trying to uh, uh, rally that type of um, response. Now, the, the digital computer, to go back to what I was saying earlier, it is originally a machine of war. I mean, many of you might know this, but initially it was designed during World War II, invented during World War II and then developed uh, soon afterwards. That's the semi-automated ground um, uh, environment, is that what it says, SAGE? Famous uh, computer during the 1950s that was developed to try and track incoming uh, aerial threats during the Cold War. But it was initially developed with a spirit of paranoia that is a completely normal spirit to hold during times of warfare, that uh, uh, new ways of uh, uh, detecting incoming threats and visualizing them on screens were necessary in order to keep uh, America safe. It was also uh, a distinctive product of particular forms of interdisciplinarity that would never have come about if it weren't for World War II. It's unlikely they would have come about in quite that way bringing science, technology, engineering, and even philosophy, there were kind of information theorists, people thinking about the nature of information, into new types of alliances, such as cybernetics, but equally bringing what later be called the uh, uh, military-industrial complex into a new type of network uh, of big business, IBM, uh, universities such as Stanford and MIT, into alliances with each other. So this was a particularly um, uh, urgent uh, uh, channeling of types of institutions that otherwise wouldn't have worked together, but also types of intellectual disciplines that wouldn't have come together in quite that way. We could also say that the language of software has a military quality to it. The language of software is about the uh, making of various commands that then get executed by a machine. There is a hierarchy, you might say, to the way in which software uh, operates. Now do this, now do this, now do this. The attempt to try and automate thinking, which was the original uh, 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 or automate comp computation, mental computation, that was the original um, uh, uh, ideal of, of digital comp computing in the 1940s, ne necessarily treats thinking and communication as, uh, uh, as commands that have to be executed. 
that this is now do this, now do this, now do this. A series of acts that have to be turned into a series of codes. Um, anyone who's interested in this type of analysis in terms of where this brings us today, there's a very good book by Yasha Levine called Surveillance Valley about the way in which the fact that these particular kinds of technologies still structure our civil society and our politics should mean that it is really no surprise that politics today has uh, started to become uh, 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 characterized as forms of combat, uh, that notions of weaponization of software and platforms and so on have become uh, quite such a common feature of our everyday political life. One of the things that Levine argues is that the internet was never weaponized, it was always a weapon. The internet was designed originally, the first internet in the early 1960s was originally designed in order to distribute intelligence around the United States so that if one city was bombed uh, during the Cold War, then there would be other centers of uh, military intelligence that were all connected up. It is a series of technologies that were forged out of a spirit of uh, paranoia and a spirit of uh, distrust of an enemy. Uh, and one of the things that people like Levine have tried to uh, remind people, because a lot of this was forgotten during the 1990s and the dot-com boom and a lot of the kind of more optimistic uh, concerns with things like um, e-democracy and so on, is that if you take these kinds of technologies and you plug them into your democracy, don't be all that surprised if your democracy starts to take on some of the qualities of, um, of uh, combat and conflict. Now, there are various ways in which troll uh, discourse uh, starts to take on some of these qualities of violence and war in recent years. Firstly, I think this question of timing and of speed has to be seen as absolutely central to the way in which online discourse starts to take on some of the qualities of violence and war. I think if you think about what Trump, Donald Trump's <coughs> Twitter feed does, its ability to set the pace or to change the pace of discourse is absolutely key. Trump, whether he sort of knows this consciously or not, one of the things that Trump can do is to disrupt the ability to have a sustained, serious, uh, uh, reasonable conversation because he can completely change the topic at any moment by simply saying something absurd on his Twitter feed or saying something outrageous. By throwing these kind of bombs out into uh, political discourse, it becomes possible to suddenly get attention and to uh, bring what might otherwise be a, a different type of conversation to a halt. I think it's something that someone like Boris Johnson in Britain has done quite effectively uh, in, in the context of Brexit as well. Um, I think that to go back to what Arendt was saying about violence, but also I think what uh, von Clausewitz was saying about resentment, one of the things which I think is so important for understanding troll culture is that on the internet, the powerless have certain advantages over the powerful. There is something about that point that Arendt is making, which is that the extreme case of violence is one against many. That in spaces of social media, it is far harder for, say, a recognized journalist or a recognized politician or a business or something that has some kind of power in the world, some capacity to coordinate, which requires being publicly recognized, which requires being accountable for one's actions and so on, that person is quite vulnerable to an attack by someone who has no power whatsoever. It's the people who have no power but the means of violence that have uh, such an advantage in these kind of spaces. Um, of course, anonymity is the great advantage that uh, a troll has in an online situation. Um, and really, publicity, the ability to have public status, public standing and recognition, is what makes it so difficult for public figures to fight back against uh, these sorts of attacks. Um, going back to what I was saying earlier, I think that we can think of civil discourse as being, maybe weaponized isn't quite the right, right word, but being having a spirit of combat and uh, warfare injected into it, precisely with this uh, misadaptation of someone's words. I think that particularly in this age of what we call big data, where so much of everything that is captured, or so much of everything that we say and do and so on is, um, uh, is captured digitally and shared digitally and so on, the ability to pull out just the single 30 second chunk or the single few words from an article or so on and to combine it with other things uh, becomes uh, an incredibly powerful, or not powerful, but an incredibly uh, disruptive and rather destructive ability. Uh, so in that sense, the trolls often are engaged in forms of curation of their own, in, in their own right. They are, uh, they are selecting the forms of content that are going to be shared and made, made, be made most visible 
Um, and this is a type of manipulation, and you could say it's a type of violence to the intended meaning that people have when they are uh, speaking or writing uh, in, a, in the traditional analog public sphere. Um, this, um, what was I gonna say? No, anyway. Um, finally, this is a kind of classic, if you think about what meme culture does, it is a classic instance of a kind of, the, the way in which knowledge becomes used in times of combat and in times of warfare. What memes do, what humor does, uh, is effectively to try and get messages from one person <coughs> to another and to circumvent one audience and to reach another. A joke is the most important means of conveying a particular meaning between <coughs> insiders and excluding outsiders. This has always been true. Before the internet, things like uh, sexist or racist humor were effectively ways of building bridges between bonds between some people and excluding other people because the humor is something that you get if you're on the inside and you don't get or you get but you uh, don't appreciate if you're on the outside. It has a kind of cultural barrier forming <coughs> Uh, logic to it, but in the relation to meme culture, it can operate in a way that is totally impervious to the uh, observer, the outside observer. The joke becomes more and more uh, convoluted, it requires more and more and more insider knowledge, and it becomes a way of coordinating allies uh, against enemies in various ways. Now, just finally, I want to talk briefly about um, the question of embodiment, because I think that one of the things that uh, all of this raises is can this be violence if it's just words? And this is, I think, one of the key problems that we need to grapple with in all of this. Um, if it's just symbols, if it's just code and software, or it's just jokes, in what sense can any of it be deemed violence? And one of the things I think that um, we need to grapple with in order to try and understand this particular state of quasi-war, quasi-civil, quasi-war, um, is the way in which the body <coughs> has come into... Uh, these forms of digital circuits in various ways. Now, this is a, uh, a quote from Mark Zuckerberg in 2015 that uh, and it's, Facebook is actually trying to do this. It might sound like science fiction, but he said, one day, I believe, we'll be able to send full, rich thoughts to each other directly using technology. You'll just be able to think of something and your friends will immediately be able to experience it too if you'd like. This would be the ultimate communication technology. Now, this is quite an interesting insight into what Zuckerberg thinks he's doing. This might be a long way off, although they have actually hired people uh, to work on some of this kind of uh, uh, various neuroscientific, um, uh, uh, what's called uh, uh, neuroimmersive haptic, well, I can't remember what it's called now, but anyway, but they have been hiring people to try and develop this kind of technology. But what's quite interesting, I think, to me about this is firstly, this suggests that ordinary language, ordinary speech, is a kind of inefficient mediator. It's something that has to be circumvented. That what people want in the way in which they communicate is a kind of pure intimacy with the minds of others. Uh, something much more like an empathy than uh, a form of um, uh, a, a reasoned discourse or a representation or a traditional forms of semiosis. It's much more a form of, uh, of, of, of something closer to uh, a, 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 an emotional intimacy, a form of empathy, but a form of kind of non-mediated communication that for Zuckerberg would be the ultimate form of communication. Um, so I could send a thought directly to someone else and I wouldn't have to actually say it, I wouldn't have to type it, I wouldn't have to uh, say it out loud or anything. Um, it could go directly from my brain to another. Now, this is actually already physically possible. There are companies like um, Elon Musk uh, is invested in a company called Neurable, which does this kind of brain-to-brain um, uh, -brain communication. Um, but I think that leaving aside the technological possibilities of it, let's just think through what this means about the nature of discourse and the nature of the public sphere. Now, some of the earliest attempts to try and do this type of work were conducted, again, under military auspices. Because in times of warfare, the, uh, this, the promise of a technology that does something like this is extremely appealing indeed, for two reasons. First of all, one of the key problems of war is how do I get my knowledge from me to someone else who is in a completely different situation through all of the noise and all of the chaos of war. This was something that Clausewitz was very clear about, is that, this, that he talked about friction. One of the great problems with planning in war is there is always friction. There is always going to be something that interferes with your plan. You might have a brilliant plan, but it's going to get messed up as it travels uh, from person A to person B who are trying to coordinate each other. So the question of how you can get a piece of information from my head in someone else's head in the uh, l most immediate way possible is a central problem in war. Even during World War II, um, this kind of problem was 
uh, crucial in things like uh, 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 aircraft for, for, for pilots because the aeroplanes were so noisy that people couldn't hear what was coming through their earphones. So there were all these different ways of trying to imagine how they might be able to communicate with each other via uh, things that might tap them on the skin on that kind of thing. And equally, this is something that, of course, things like Apple Watches and so on now do is they, they actually act on your body. They don't just simply send you information in a logical textual form. They try and you start to use your body in ways to try and communicate to you directly in various ways. Of course, it also, and this comes back a bit to uh, what the, talking about the uh, uh, defense of torture in the Bush administration, the question of how do I extract information from the brain or the mind of someone who doesn't want to give it to me has also been a long-term fantasy of warfare. Things like the idea of, of brainwashing, the idea of uh, mind reading, the ability to use telepathy. There are all these crazy experiments during the Cold War which tried to use telepathy to find out what the Russians were up to, and people like Yuri Geller were employed by the US military to try and uh, uh, tap into various forms of communication and so on. There was a lot of kind of paranormal uh, interest in all of this sort of thing. But all of that is to say that Zuckerberg sees this as being something that is uh, kind of warm and lovely and empathetic and so on, but it also speaks of a certain kind of paranoia that civil society and the public sphere is not uh, a kind of uh, safe enough environment through which to send information through. And I think that what we can see arising all around us, because there was this whole idea of what was called cyberspace during the 1990s. Uh, the Virtual Community was a big book by Howard Rheingold in the 1990s. And, you know, that people talk about, is this online or is it real life? You know, as if these two things were kind of parallel spheres. And I think increasingly what we see today is that the utopia of, of, of Silicon Valley isn't just uh, a type of kind of sensory surveillance architecture uh, to try and track behavior in various ways of the sort that someone like Yasha Levine was talking about, but it is ultimately a complete integration of digital forms of code and biological forms of code. And I think that it's worth just playing, paying attention to the way in which bodies are uh, at the center of so much of our online discourse, to go back to some of these kind of, the way in which metaphors of violence, metaphors of bodily impact and violence uh, and the idea of feelings as being that which is being uh, uh, kind of fought over in online spaces. Uh, the, what we're sort of grappling with here is a set of technologies that are neither completely immaterial nor traditionally physiological as we would normally understand them. And that, I think, is leading into a kind of this new gray area between uh, a space of uh, cultural symbolism and a space of, uh, of, of physical combat of the sort that then generates this sense of new types of war that are developing all the time. So just to kind of finish, um, we live in a sort of nervous state of online discourse. There is, um, I think you could say that uh, the internet has turned out to be a kind of dissensus forming device. It has been proved extremely capable of violating existing forms of consensus, including lots of very bad forms of consensus. And in that sense, I think um, you know, there are various examples of how the internet can do damage and can violate existing institutions. And some of these institutions should be violated. We shouldn't see this automatically as a bad thing. But what we have that we don't really understand is how any of these technologies, if, as I'm just basically getting to, uh, if these technologies are primarily tools of violence rather than tools of power, what does that enable us to do politically in terms of actually constructing new types of institutions? So we've become very good at tearing things down, but we are left with a very serious problem of how to uh, build them up back up again. So I'm going to stop with that. Thank you. Um, I know one of the claims of your book is that in the conditions you're describing, with an overload of information, mm. uh, we're kind of um, just all the elements. I mean, it's kind of very exhaustive and mm. comprehensive account of kind of traditions, I guess, of where, of how we are where we are, mm. um, and also why we're finding it difficult to manage in traditional political social forms, which are not, which are, which are more based on notions of peace yeah. than notions of war. If we're in a general condition of war, like world war forever, um, it's, we can't apply those traditional categories, mm. like peace-based categories of social life and kind of interpersonal life um, in, in the new conditions. And that kind of maybe explains some of the crisis and the, and the kind of problems uh, acclimatizing to the new new circumstances yep. through through uh, social networks and so on. Um, but one of the things that you state in your book uh, and some of the articles you've written 
is that when we're overwhelmed, uh, we turn to feeling and affect mm. uh, in order to kind of navigate our way mm. through things, which is completely the contrary to kind of rationalist, yeah. rationalist Western notion where uh, in order to understand where we are collectively, consensually, and so on, um, we, we, need to under, we need to understand it. And so you need to rationalize the world, map it, mm. and then find a trajectory through it. Uh, but if there's too much information mm. and you're not even clear what the map is, all you have is, I guess it came out through the sense of um, uh, sniffing your way through. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but I, wanted, I was wondering if you could have to, um, elaborate a little bit on the emotional or affective side of that, because that's very sensorial. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, excuse me. That, uh, that's right. Um, yeah, um, I think, just on that, there's an interesting um, example of how that, uh, what I trace back to Clausewitz about scenting in war, that the general has an ability to scent out the truth. Um, there was a, an example which I mentioned in the book, which is that um, Amazon obviously has the things like Amazon Echo and these kind of devices that are in the home now. Um, one of the things that they've now patented is what they call a voice sniffing device which is a kind of really interesting sort of mixing of sensory metaphors. One's a metaphor, one's not a metaphor. But the idea that you could sniff a voice is quite an interesting um, kind of playing around with the, with the senses, I think. Um, and that's what the echo will do, is because it will begin to learn who's speaking and therefore it will be into... So there's, there's that. And the other thing which, of course, those, those um, devices are uh, developing towards doing is being able to sense the affect in the voice of the person who is... Is speaking. Um, so there was a kind of the, the Telegraph reported about a week or two ago that, uh, with some shock, understandably, that um, a that Amazon had a patent for something that basically would be able to tell if someone was upset in their own home, and then it could start to kind of recommend them things. Um, you know, just from hearing someone's voice or hearing them crying or something like that, it would it would know what to recommend them and that sort of thing. So this is a sort of rather frightening. Future. Don't get an Amazon Echo if you haven't got. One. I haven't got one, but I, I think it's it's it'd arrive in a day, right? So yeah, that's you right. Set today, you have to wait a whole day to get your. Well, I suppose. Well, maybe not. Well, maybe it'll come by drone or something. Yeah, um, but um, uh, in terms of the, the the senses, I think one of the problems we've got right now, and I think that this is the problem of big data. So big data generally refers to the data that is automatically captured from our day-to-day -day movements and communications and so on. So we have these data archives that are bigger than anything, um, than anything before. We have, you know, these sort of things that no human mind could possibly navigate in any way, and that's why algorithms um, are necessary to, 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 to explore them and to find patterns within them. Um, but I think that where does, what does that leave the human mind to do, in a way? And in a sense, the human mind has to then decide or feel what to pay attention to. What, in a world where everything has been tracked and everything has been stored and there is too much to pay attention to, where do you get drawn towards? And in a sense, I think you kind of alluded to it earlier, which is that you, you are heavily motivated by your sense of outrage and your sense of who the, who's lying. So um, I think that what someone like Trump does very, very well, and I think this is also true of various populists, and this is in some ways, I think, the, the, um, uh, the resonance between populism and, and the age of big data, is to call out the bullshitters. That's what, so Trump, it's ridiculous given what a liar Trump is, but the, what people loved so much about Trump was that he called out Hillary Clinton as a bullshitter and a criminal. And there are a lot of people out there who believe that this is the case. And in a sense, I think that what the, the, the kind of truth that emerges is, and we all have our own thing that we're outraged by. We all, you know, we might hate, you know, the banks, or we might hate this, or we might hate that. We all feel that there's some part of the world that is not being governed as it should be in some way. I think that's a fairly kind of normal kind of human sentiment. But it's perhaps um, something that, that is, I think, the affective, uh, the, the means of effective mobilization. Now, it's also the case that these platforms like Facebook, and this has been sort of scientifically studied, um, they can see that content that has what they call, there's an actual word for it, I can't remember what it is, but it's basically a form of sort of speaking somehow to people's sense of outrage, will travel a lot further than uh, content that is just sort of reasonable and, and factual. Uh, the one thing I've often noticed on Twitter is, I mean, if someone, if someone gets something wrong on Twitter, 
It goes, it goes everywhere. People are like, that's wrong, that's wrong. If someone gets something, it just makes a kind of statement of fact on Twitter, and no one, no one cares. So I think that it's a, there's, a, there's a sense of, the, whatever the affective state is, the sense of kind of injustice combined with the sense that someone is lying to you becomes a key uh, emotional um, uh, uh, sort of state that leads people to, to focus there rather than focus over there. Okay. Um, I, I guess what I, my interest in the affect bit is partly because it's been a prevalent, prevalent theme in art. Mm. So in a way, uh, contemporary art has, uh, and modern art as well, but contemporary art especially, has really promoted affect mm. as, a, as a way to kind of recover some notion of uh, subjective centeredness or subjective coherence against the sort of uh, you know, standardizing claims of rationalism mm. and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think there's an immediate concern mm. about the importance of affect mm. in the new political formation. But I think in regard to the dissensus slide that you have, yeah. that you finish with, um, it strikes me that if, if you rely on how you feel about things as a way to get mm. through, because there is no map, yeah. all you have is just like you can just fumble your way through and sniff your way through, um, basically you're left to your own devices. Like, so the, the rational, mm. you know, what's critiqued as the standardizing, all the bad stuff, mm. the, the kind of rational mapping of the world requires kind of commonality. Uh, we, we all have a map that we share. We can disagree about details or kind of mm. even whether it's the right map in the end, but at least we're having that discussion. Whereas uh, the reliance on affect, and I think, again, this is something that prevails in contemporary art, um, it's up to the subject on their own to determine their way, in the case of contemporary art, through the meaning of the artwork or mm. what it means for them. Um, but it seems as though the conditions you're describing, this kind of ubiquitous warfare all the time, mm. forever, um, leaves us just on our own individually. But we, we're and not, I, because I, we, 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 yeah, go on. So I'm just wondering if that's part of the, uh, I guess the paranoid construction, mm. but also the search for re-establishing mm. some forms of social bonds on new terms, in yeah. very contingent terms. But I mean, I think the, the point is that the, um, uh, the, 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 type of, the type of truth that, is, that emerges from, in this big data environment, is, is pattern recognition. Um, it's the ability to extract um, intelligence literally means something like choose between. So it's the ability to actually extract from various things that could be looked at, it's the ability to extract some type of shape, some kind of form from things. So that is what uh, ultimately, and this is ultimately something that is done algorithmically and, 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 and digitally rather than by some kind of uh, individual. Although I think in a way you could say that what someone like you know, Trump, it's difficult to call him an intelligent person, but he does nevertheless, he, he, he sets an agenda in a world that is overwhelming and in a world that is complex and fast moving and in which there is far more data than anyone can ever know in a, in a human sense. He tells you what is relevant. He has this relevance defining ability and that then becomes a world that people can inhabit. I mean, some people talk about this as tribalism. It's not a word I particularly like because I feel like it's almost sort of, it's sort of, it, 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 sort of it, it suggests that we're sort of, you know, that this stuff has just sort of happened for no reason in some way. But I think that there are communities of affect. I don't think you're on your own. I think that everything is, you know, people like you also liked. I mean, that's the sort of, you know, the first time that many of us encountered this kind of thing was with the Amazon recommendation system. I remember first using Amazon in the 1990s and that people like you also liked. It's like, wow, they're right. You know, that's, that's great. That's, that's magic. You know, and then now, of course, you realize that you are being put into a, a, a small category of, of, of one of, of several thousand or maybe several million um, of different types of uh, affective communities. So I'm not sure you're on your own. It's just that, uh, and this is what you know, lots of people have talked about being the, the problem of echo chambers, where you could have you know, right. hundreds of different conversations going on where people are uh, mobilized around a similar set of affective concerns. The great problem of the, you know, the, I mean, this isn't, a, I mean, I thought the Trevor Noah thing was, was terrific, and uh, I concur with everything he said, but the, 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 the real fear that that should engender is not just that Kavanaugh succeeded, it's that somewhere else, on Fox or somewhere, there is the identical conversation going on, but with the terms completely turned on their heads in a completely different way. Um, so uh, that is the, the real problem is that, you know, these are just affective communities that are all kind of circling one another. And uh, the, 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 the grounds of justice no longer uh, are sort of external to the community. That's the, the ultimate fear. And are not common. They're not common. And it's a form of, I mean, in philosophy, this is sometimes called communitarianism, but it's a kind of an extreme communitarianism because it lacks 
the, uh, the fundamental starting point that we all have to share the same society. Okay, uh, 10 minutes of questions. There's one, uh, oh, quite a few. Okay, so there's one, we'll just we'll work our way up the thing. So start with Lewis first. If you could keep them quite short, because we have a few, and the world's got to go mm. quite soon. All right, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I, I want to ask a bit about um, state torture. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it briefly. Um, it seems like there's this uh, ambiguous state, which is descending over civil society, which you talk about, where there are all of these ambiguous figures that the state's not really well equipped to deal with. Um, so terrorists, certainly, like lone shooters, mm. um, and was, it, it seems to me that the, the way the state deals with these people is increasingly sort of punitive. Mm -hmm. uh, it has this, like, torture seems to have this, um, this strange relationship somewhere between violence and power, as, as you've sort of described it, or taken from mm -hmm. that. Um, I was wondering if you had any sort of elaboration on that, or if you think about that at all in the book, mm -hmm. or just to um, the briefly. Yeah, I mean, not, 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 not particularly, although I think it's very frightening. And, oh, sorry, should we wait for the others? No. Uh, we'll take, yeah, we'll take three. Let's actually let's 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 because we haven't got much time. We'll take yeah. three questions, and then we we'll can sort of take them all together. Yeah, thanks for that. It's kind of good, good way to. There's this one there. Um, I yeah. was curious about this word that you used, um, that people when they are communicating seek to get into the fear of the minds of others, mm. and that this is like um, the people want empathy, um, which I'm kind of drawn into this, but. Um, then I wonder like how this desire to have pure intimacy with the minds and maybe also the like the, the internal self gets like like there is this like maybe confusion in reality like reality you know like a misdirected mm -hmm. desire and then this becomes a violence where like I mean I think about like Called like colonial violence, and um, mm. where there is like um, this denial of the violence in infiltrating mm. the like the the body, the nation, like people as a whole, um, and then how this denial of the violence of infiltrating something gets projected onto the victim, mm. like um, you know, like the colonizer goes back on saying even even the sixties of like oh but the indigenous people are violent you know mm. they are cannibals and there is also this then similar thing of like almost like they they the victim becomes a perpetrator but mm. this is you know a denial to the other side mm. yeah you know it's just um, also thinking about how the submission and domination play into this mm. place of your intimacy mm. with the minds of others. Mm. Okay, then there's one question on the stairs over there. So we'll take these three together. Um, my question is concerned with the monetization of our rape, the circulation, mm. because um, you mentioned the means. So I'm wondering if there's any sort of consideration if there's a hierarchy that there should be a written language of war and a visualized language of mm. war. So like Christian Lee and Christian mm. Trotsky see that too, what is written language. Yeah. Um, and in terms of monetization, I mean, is the pension circulated more because of the means? Is mm. there any consideration of that? So, yeah. Do you want me to summarize or do you want to um, think, think go through them? Yeah, go, go on. Okay, give me the mic. All right, so there's three questions. One was about the um, how the state can't really cope with the new type of figure that's emerging that we're always highlighting is outside of the kind of social norm status. The second question was around, I think it was around how the points towards the end around for pure intimacy is kind of being developed around these technologies accords with um, uh, whether that presents a kind of violence and what kind of, how we can figure that kind of violence according to histories to do with colonialism or submission domination. And the third one was around the monetization of mm. the meme especially, or different types of monetization according to media. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't really talk that much about torture in the book, but I think that, I mean, certainly there's, there's something, um, there's something obviously very frightening going on right now, um, and we can see this possibly 
with the Brazilian election of the uh, the desire for people who are uh, pro torture. You know, that the states should torture. That's becoming a sort of a a, um, a something that. You know, Nigel Farage has said some similar things to this, that actually it's right that states should use violence against other people's bodies, that this is not a legal issue, this is something that, the, that state power should consist of something like this. And I think that that, for whatever reason, and there are various reasons underlying all of this, the sentiment, the effect, affective state into which something like Trumpism fits is the fact is the, is, the, is the is the feeling that justice is not done in our society any longer and clearly this is something that well, I mean, I'm not a great expert on Brazilian politics but from what I've been reading the last few days I mean this is clearly the sense that that, that, that we ne now finally justice is going to come along is the sense that the justice system in its kind of civil liberal form is not adequate for delivering real justice in some way and real justice has to be visited upon the body that is I think crucial to the kind of pitch that someone like Trump makes that whole locker up thing about Hillary Clinton that that slogan spoke about something far broader than her stupid emails. I mean, this was a, an idea that states need to rediscover the, 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 the power to use violence, and not violence in a, in a measured judicial fashion, but violence in an excessive fashion. So that's the, that's the key thing, is that states can use violence deliberately and, and in a measured way in the liberal tradition, but uh, what states need to be rediscover in some way is some is something is a more I mean if anyone's ever read Foucault's Discipline and Punish it starts with this famous distinction between modern violence and pre-modern violence and the pre-modern is kind of excessive and demonstrative and symbolic and public and the modern is measured private um, and much more kind of guarded uh, and he talks about this and in a sense I think there's a kind of uh, some latent desire to get back to the to the pre-modern but I don't know um, what more to say about that in relation to, to, to what I've said on the the question of this pure intimacy and violence, I think that this is the, this is the thing. It, I mean, in some ways, this stems from a, a neurological paradigm, in a sense. To go back to my kind of opening point about, you know, we live in, a, in this completely post-Cartesian, post-mental era now. In a way, it's true that col colonized subjects were never granted the recognition of having a, 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 a rational subjectivity in the first place. They never were granted the rights. They were never governed in that fashion. Now, in a sense, what I think has happened is that the mentality of being colonized has now flipped the whole way back into the center of colonial power. I mean, this is what I mean, Fintan O'Toole has written about this in relation to Brexit, that Britain could only ever conceive of itself as either an imperial power or as, an, or as a colonized power. And it's sort of, you sort of flip from one to the other. This is clearly, you know, Trump and his stuff about the globalists is that our nation has been colonized. So there is a sense that, I'm, I'm slightly going off the topic a bit, but I think that, that the, the, the problem of, of how does liberalism persist in a, in a where without an idea of liberal subjectivity is at the core of lots of these sorts of trends we see right now. But I think that fundamentally, I think that, yeah, this intimacy is the idea that a thought can travel or a feeling can travel from mind in mind into mind, someone else's mind, and it will change it. And it might change it without, the, without that person's permission. There is in some ways, a, I suppose, a uh, you know, I mean, whether that's violence, but I think it's, I mean, it's a, it, it, once thinking is conceived of as physiological, and if communication is conceived as physiological, as, as physical, as, as purely performative, then it becomes, it does become very hard to distinguish where that ends and, and violence begins. But that's maybe where we need a whole new vocabulary, uh, because of course there is uh, a, a, a happier way of thinking of, of these sorts of things, of, of, of physical intimacy and love and empathy that maybe Zuckerberg thinks he is engaging in, but I think that you know, understanding some of the military provenance of this is important. And then finally on memes, I mean of course, I mean in some ways advertising has been doing this for over a hundred years and I mean the image has always had the, the kind of aff an affective capacity that the word has not had and, and this was, you know, nationalists recognise this and nationalists recognise it in, the, you know, in relation to flags and symbols and myths and legends and so on and I mean, the, when Edward Bernays was writing about propaganda in the 1830s, he was saying, you know, politicians, stop using these words because pe words don't work. Look at what the guys in the business community are doing. They're using pictures. Start using pictures like they do and you might start achieving the same kind of outcomes. That's, the, that's sort of what Bernays was, was, was characterising as propaganda. And, of course, meme is, is peer-to-peer propaganda, basically. I mean, it's, you know, this is, this, is what, um, this is what we're seeing around us. So I think that... Yeah, it's, it's the outright, I'm not a great expert on the outright, but I think that it's, it's to, have a, to have a political movement that in its origins is dealing in graphics rather than in text, 
I think is worth noting, at least in terms of what kind of political movement that's likely to be. Because that was also what, when Clausewitz and others were identifying the origins of nationalism after the French Revolution, nationalism back then had to be graphic-based because most people couldn't read. So there was a kind of need to mobilize people around new flags, new songs, new, or, yeah, not just graphics, but you know, the, 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 the role of the, of the non-textual in, in creating new communities of affect. Has, has, it goes right back to the origins of, of both nationalism but also of, of propaganda. All right, so there's one question there. And you had a question? Okay, we'll take these two and then we'll, we'll close. Yes, thanks for your talk. Um, I have two questions or comments, both of all around the same thing, I think. The first one is about your hypothesis following our work of Berlioz and Stalin, which I understand, but it's more a question. I understand that you define violence more in terms of an event, mm. and something which is, or an action, or something which happened, and not so much as a process, which, and you link that then to a sort of form of perception of how we perceive violence. Mm. And that makes me wonder if that doesn't not make, at least in that sense, will um, repeat the dominant form of power, the dominant distribution of the sensible in the sense that, um, like what we've seen in the introduction, that some people are allowed to claim anger, some people are allowed to claim victimhood, and some are. So in that sense, um, we will see violence as being journalist because murdered and not just being the people who are dying of hunger. Mm. We will see, um, for instance, I will uh, repeat mm. that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, uh, as violence and not So that's the first one. The second one I found was that I was wondering, or your talk was in a way very abstract, and you mm. said that it was mm, devoid of very clear political references. Mm. And I was again wondering if you did not think too much from, or if you, much of what you say is not related to dominant form of power. Mm. In the sense that like redemption is something which has to do with a dominant class and and that they have been promised things and they have not been delivered upon their promises. But as a whole, bunch of population have never been promised anything. Yeah. Don't feel the best. Um, so I, in that sense, again, um, if it does not, if, it, if, because if we're losing the communal, then it's because the ones in power are not caring anymore about having mm. something which is communal and not because everybody is acting in that way. Right. Maybe just take that while the mic goes yeah. across. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, but I'm not trying to. Con I'm not trying to capture everything as everything bad in the world as violence. I mean, there are injustices and there are forms of exploitation and there are forms of inequality in power and so on that um, that you've alluded to in various ways that uh, are not. The, 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 I think by Aaron's definition anyway, do not count as violence. So I'm not, I'm not trying to use violence to capture everything that's bad in the world. There are plenty of bad things in the world that I haven't talked about. And that's not to say that I, I kind of just accept them uncritically. Um, I think um, your, your, your second point is, um, you know, I think that's a, it's an interesting, interesting point. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I suppose I am, I am talking about the kind of disintegration of what some people might see as the liberal, possibly bourgeois public sphere. Um, and in that sense, you could say that it's, a, it's an elitist set of concerns to, to worry about this kind of thing. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's unleashing various forms of, 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 of danger and forms of violence that need to be kind of um, uh, understood. But I, I mean, it's not an exhaustive account of the, the crisis that we're in by any means. I, I, I accept that. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is something that you already implied um, in the talk, but I just wanted to clarify it for myself. This uh, unclear division between mind and body, is it, uh, can we also say uh, it extends to this unclear division between reason and affect? Uh, and is there any truth to this, you mm. know, uh, convergence, or mm. is it completely something made up in the space of the online space? 
Um, and yeah, and mm. I can explain more, but the, in terms of like thinking of grief and um, as a sequential kind mm. of time-based procedure and affect as something that we more think about as like a spatial, you know, be with the other as mm. an empathy. Um, yeah. Um, well, I suppose we've got different sort of frames of reference, maybe. I mean, I think, um, uh, I suppose I'm thinking partly of the turn towards the brain that has been such a, uh, a key um, feature of various discourses in, even in economics and marketing and uh, mental health and all sorts of areas of society. And, you know, you look at the work of the sociologist Nicholas Rose, which is all about this kind of way in which we switch from understanding ourselves as, as, as psychological creatures to understanding ourselves as neurological creatures. Uh, and the brain is a, is a sensory organ. It's a, it's a way of, 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 of processing feeling. And I think and the, probably the, the, the neuroscientists who've done so much to kind of push this, this uh, understanding is uh, Antonio Damasio, who has this kind of famous thesis that actually, if you can't feel, you can't reason either, that reason is actually that reason in, reasoned thought, as we understand it in our Cartesian tradition, is constantly dependent on various affective qualities. So there's been a kind of a, and that was during the kind of early 1990s that he was writing this sort of thing. And there's been a kind of, I think, a progressive breakdown. The, the, and this has become extremely influential in, in computer science and in particularly, obviously, in, in marketing as well, that the, the rational and affective capacities of, of the brain are so intimately linked that we need new ways of trying to distinguish them if we can distinguish them at all. Now, one of the ways in which I think it's interesting to, to think about this is um, there's the, the book that probably many of you will know because it's kind of a bestseller with Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, which in a sense says, that, and it's a kind of a metaphorical distinction because I don't think it's a sort of absolute distinction, but is the things that we do psychologically instantly in various ways which allow us to kind of inhabit an environment and to process situations in some sort of real time versus the ability to kind of make a plan, plot way up various courses of action and so on. But the reason I think that at the very least that metaphor is quite interesting is that it turns the whole question of distinction between what we once would have thought of as reason and affect into one of, of, of different speeds in a way. And I think that certainly it's clear that if one's in the world of, of, of online social media marketing or any other type of kind of you know uh, design of, of, a, of, a, of a retail environment or whatever it might be, trying to get people to use their fast thinking capacities rather than their slow thinking ones is central to the task of trying to um, shape and control behavior, um, which suggests that any form of um, type of politics or democracy at all needs in some ways to start to recreate the spaces or to secure or defend the spaces within which slow type of um, uh, uh, thinking can go on again. Now again, that might make me sound like a, some sort of, like I'm just trying to resuscitate the, the liberal bourgeois public sphere to some extent, but I, I, I do think that um, there are worse things than the liberal bourgeois public sphere and we might be about to encounter them. I don't know if that's the best defense, but um, I, I mean, it, it does seem to me that the kind of uh, fast response, I think, one fast thinking, um, and the breakdown of the liberal public sphere um, is kind of why I wanted you to come in to mm. conclude this series of talks. So it does seem to me that's a good description of what's happening. Uh, and in relation to this audience and like being in the art field and so on, that's exactly the public sphere mm. that art has relied on mm. through, moder through modernism and also contemporary art to do what it does. So the question for the art field is if that's where it's breaking down, art can't rely upon its conventions or like mm -hmm. the expectations of its normal functioning. Um, but the question it does throw up is, uh, which is one for you to answer now, <laughs> more rhetorical question to conclude, um, what, what will replace it and how will it be replaced? Mm -hmm. right? So, and it, it seems to me that actually art can play quite a good role in this because it's not restricted to uh, any particular medium and can also operate in many different ways than the policy unit or the academic and so on and so forth. Um, so that's the challenge. Um, so to conclude, Will has his book launch on Wednesday at six o'clock. Yeah, but yeah, it's, 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 it's got, it, it had a ticket thing. It was, I'm afraid it was it sold out. It, sold out. it was mainly, it was slightly aimed at our undergraduate students. Oh, okay. So it might be full, unfortunately, I'm afraid. But All right. <laughs> well, you can just kind of storm in anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but if you want his book and the other books, they're on sale outside at discount prices. <laughs> Um, so with that, thank you, Will. Great. And thanks for the series. Thank you.